Speaking of uh, the values of Judaism and uh, propaganda, those are two things that you've mentioned. I thank you very much for that. I want to go to the topic of Israeli propaganda. Um, <laughs> you wrote in your book here that Hasbara, Israeli propaganda, is a, a form of warfare. You described it as a form of warfare. How would you how would you describe Israeli propaganda, Hasbara, as being different than other propaganda that all countries and all politicians have? And what impact do you think it has on the United States and our political uh, decisions? That's an immense question. But of course, there is a ministry uh, in Israel that is responsible for Hasbara. And um, it, I think the Israelis do it very skillfully. Um, that is to say, um, uh, they uh, come up with uh, uh, explanations, which is, I guess, what the word means. Yes. Um, to um, that are uh, moderately convincing to the ignorant, um, and um, uh, and they thereby cover up uh, other interpretations of what's happening. Um, I had personal experience of this when. I was asked to become the director of uh, for national intelligence analysis at the National Intelligence Council. And I uh, was accused of being a realist uh, on, on the pages of the Wall Street Journal, uh, which was translated later in other articles saying that I was insufficiently emotionally linked to Israel. Um, in no, insufficiently I, emotionally linked to Israel. Well, that was the thing, that was it, you see. Um, that's realism, and it's unacceptable. Um, so, um, in other words, if I were to be allowed to uh, oversee intelligence analysis, I would not bend it in the direction favored by Israel. Um, and um, so um, I was uh, attacked by all the usual Zionist organizations. Attacked in um, what way? Uh, oh, I think mugged on the internet, um, uh, muttered against in the halls of Congress. There was a very interesting, <laughs> the Washington Post on the day I decided that obviously I couldn't do the job, uh, I was being asked to do it for two reasons. One, to restore credibility to American intelligence, which had, it had largely lost as a result of the Iraq debacle. Um, and second, to improve the quality of intelligence. I thought I knew how to do both. Uh, but it was clear that if I was constantly under attack um, for presumed prejudice against Israel, um, I was not going to be able to, do, to improve the credibility of intelligence because I would be controversial. And second, uh, I could not uh, have the liberty to reform the system that I thought I needed. So I. Uh, I resigned. I, I had. I will not do this. I said. Um, the Washington Post that day had three stories. Uh, first, they had an editorial saying I was a crackpot because I imagined there was an Israel lobby. Um, you which imagined there was an Israel lobby. The, there's. A, I, this was obviously an inst an evidence of temp of some sort of insanity because um, such a thing does not exist. And then on the front page, there was a story about how the Israel lobby had lobbied up on the hill and everywhere else uh, to get rid of me, with many details by Walter Pinkus, a very uh, sound journalist. And then uh, on the editorial page, uh, sorry, on the op-ed page was a piece by David Broder, who said that this was the fact that I couldn't do this job was an indication of the low condition to which our country had fallen, and it was it was a, a tragedy. Uh, so uh, New York Times, uh, pretty much the same day, had a front page article again detailing uh, the activities of this non-existent lobby. Um, so um, uh, what was that all about? Well, it was about ensuring that nobody in a position of authority uh, questions anything Israel does. Um, and in fact, for the most part, we don't question what Israel does. Why? Why not? Well, self-censorship is a good deal of it. 
um, I'll tell you a story. Mm -hmm. I basically, I spent my career in diplomacy for the most part trying to avoid the Middle East because it's where hypocrisy first got a bad name. And so I didn't want to be there. So um, eventually uh, I was in Maputo, Mozambique, mm -hmm. and I got a call from George H.W. Bush asking me if I would represent the United States in him in Saudi Arabia. And I gulped and said, yes. Um, it took me 15 seconds to wind up the necessary enthusiasm, but I did. Um, and uh, so uh, I went off uh, to, to, uh, uh, to the Middle East. When I left my ambassadorship, I hoped to leave the Middle East behind me, but I wasn't able to do that. Um, and I found myself one day in, I think it was in Dubai, might have been in Abu Dhabi, anyway, it was in the UAE. Um, and I turned on the evening television and the Arabic news, and, uh, and I saw a clip, a home movie taken by somebody in Gaza. Uh, we showed a young man, young Arab man, being taken out of his home by two Israeli, I don't know what they were, police or Shin Bet or whatever they were, but um, they took him out. Um, they kicked the hell out of him. They kicked him in the head, and then they shot him in the head and walked away laughing. And I said to myself, you know, all hell is going to break loose when this is seen in the United States. It never appeared. Um, so at that point, I, that was the moment which I realized that um, there was a wall of of propaganda and denial between us and uh, the realities of of, uh, of, of life uh, in and around uh, Israel. Now, of course, Israel is not the only country that does this, uh, but it is by far the most effective in my view. And it is aided and abetted uh, by useful idiots in synagogues all over the United States. Zionists. Yeah, Zionists, exactly. So who, who um, I understand, um, although I do understand it in intellectually, I find it difficult to understand emotionally. Um, and we don't have a distinction in English between those two things, but there's other languages do. Um, and um, that uh, there are many people whose identity is wound up with their with uh, the state of Israel. Um, now, I find that, um, that now I reveal my Puritan heritage, I suppose. I find that idolatrous. Well, I'm from Jewish heritage, and I find that idolatrous as well. Well, the, the sad thing is that um, Puritans uh, thought they were Hebrews, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> so it's the same tradition. Um, the church should be. At least in, in Puritan tradition, it's the same. Yeah, exactly. Well, of course, you don't recognize it. I'm not asking you to. Um, but um, I think um, uh, I've reasoned my way through this. I confess I really wasn't very interested in Israel or anything to do with it previously. And I, when I arrived in Saudi Arabia, I really didn't know anything about mm -hmm. what was going on in the Holy Land. And, um, and I gradually was educated by as events uh, occurred, and um, and I really think uh, Zionism is the negation of everything that I think is valuable in, in Judaism. Uh, it is uh, not in search of the truth. It is in search of imposing lies in place of the truth. That's Hasbara. Um, it is not in search of justice. Uh, it is deeply embedded in ongoing injustices. Uh, it is not concerned with the sanctity of human life. Um, it is cruel uh, to the point of being occasionally murderous. And uh, I find nothing to admire in it. Um, so I draw a distinction. I do not believe that Israel is entitled to consider itself a Jewish state because while there may be many Jews living there, the state does not behave in a manner consistent with the universal values of the religion. 
Um, so and, I probably condemn myself now to some terrible fate, but that's and, and So thing. before before we go further, I just want to go on the record telling the viewers that besides uh, that long list of accomplishments that uh, Ambassador Freeman has, he's also a personal friend of mine. I know him for years, and I want to go on the record saying he is neither an anti-Semite nor prejudiced against anybody that I know of or any country that I know of, including Israel. Uh, and Chaz, Israel not only calls itself uh, a Jewish state, but the Jewish state. They made a law that they are the nation state of the Jewish people. That means that Israel is my nation state. Uh, and Benjamin Netanyahu explained in his book why he believes anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And he said, and it's not just him, Avig de Lieberman and Israel's own website said the same thing, and Danny Ayalon said the same thing, and various other Zionist dignitaries. Netanyahu said that what France is to the French and Japan is to the Japanese, Israel is to the Jews. And that's and, and just like you cannot be against the existence of France and before the French people, and you cannot be against the existence of Japan and before the Japanese people, you cannot be against the existence of Israel and, and before the Jewish people. Now, that's what Zionism is. Without Zionism, the equation is Japan is to the Japanese, what France is to the French, what Israel is to the Israelis. Exactly. Zionism, and that makes Israel's nationalism, which is we call Zionism, different than all other nationalisms in the world. People need to understand this. Israel is driven by an ideology called Zionism. It's their unique brand of nationalism. There is no other country in the world that claims not to be the representatives of their citizens, but rather the representatives of some arbitrary class of people, they will consider the Jews perhaps an ethnicity or a race, Jabotinsky said, or whatever they decide the Jews are, which means two things. Thing number one, uh, the, if you are a non-Jew in Israel, although you are officially entitled to civil rights, you are not entitled to national self-determination rights. Israel is not your nation state. On the flip side, if you are a Jew like me, that has nothing to do with Israel. To me, it's just some country in the Middle East, no different than Turkey uh, or, or any European state like England, it's just a country, claims to be my state. Um, Jonathan Pollard said, this is public record, he doesn't deny it, he said it, that American Jews should spy on the United States on behalf of Israel because Israel's your nation state and Jews do have dual loyalty. He's a disgusting despicable, dangerous person, and that's what Zionism is. Never mind all the things that you had mentioned. I'm talking about Zionism is dangerous for Jews. And as you know, my sure. policy is that Jews, as Jews, I, I think that this is an important point that a lot of anti-Zionist activists outside of Israel sometimes don't realize, and it's kind of a trap. If somebody in the United States of America says, well, I'm a Jew, and if I'm a Jew, I need to object to things that Israel does that I find objectionable. That's Zionism. Because Zionism says that you as a Jew are connected with that country, Israel. Now, if Japan would do something objectionable, I would not say as a Jew, I need to object to what Japan does or I need to object to what China does, although I object to a lot of things China does, right, and Japan. But, and as an American, I could say, as an American, we give tax dollars to Japan, or as a human being, I, I want to uh, throw in my voice here. But as a Jew, for a Jew to say, I object to, I need, I feel an obligation to object to what Israel does, because I'm a Jew, nested inside that idea, is an encouragement of Zionism that says Israel is connected to the Jews. I, I don't get involved with Israel's human rights issues any more than I do with China's or Afghanistan's or Egypt. I remember once I spoke for your group in Washington, Chaz, and you had mentioned, yes, but as an American, a taxpayer, you should get involved. I concede that point, I agree. But Afghanistan gets many tax dollars of the United States, as does Egypt, right? For a Jew to be involved in Israeli politics uh, more than they are Afghanistan or Egypt or 
anywhere else because they're Jewish. That's the point. You're actually encouraging Zionism. To me, Israel is China. It has no more or less connection to me than China. If somebody says it does, that's Zionism. I would encourage activists if they really want, actually, this is the best thing for the Israeli people and the Palestinian people. The best thing would be if the Israeli-Palestinian conflict would be uh, bereft of this ideological, pseudo-religious element, which keeps it alive. The, the, this is uh, the Jewish state, like Naftali Bennett said on, on national TV, God gave us this land. I don't know what religion Naftali Bennett is from, but God giving us the land has nothing to do with the state of Israel, nothing to do with what's going on in Israel today, nothing in my religion. I don't know about his religion. His religion is Zionism. But this, it needs to become a normal political issue. And then you can, that, then you can deal with it. Once it, you elevate it to a religious issue uh, or an ideological issue, Zionism, which is some pseudo-civic religion, it's never going to end. And, and the bottom line problem is that a, a Jewish state and a democratic state, well, if you're going to run according to what you, meaning the Knesset, considers Jewish values, or what the politicians consider Jewish values, they conflict very often with democratic values in their Zionist minds, and they need to, they all say this, they need to form a balance between them. But there should not be a balance. Israel needs to be a normal country, and then it can start a normal process of resolution. This needs to become a normal conflict. And the only way to do it is for the Jews all over to say, Israel, you know what? They can, Jews can have an opinion regarding what Israel does, whether they approve it or don't approve it, just like they have an opinion about anybody else. They can have an opinion regarding uh, whether Israel is a valid service provider to the Jews in case of another Holocaust. Can you run there or not? That's a difference of opinion. America was a uh, a, a place for uh, survivors of the Holocaust, like it says on the Statue of Liberty, which, by the way, Emma Lazarus was a Zionist. Um, <laughs> I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, Emma La Lazarus was a, was a big Zionist, and yeah, she was the one that... Well, nobody's perfect, you know. Uh, uh, even Brandeis had started off in a different direction. That's right. Uh, and, and that way. Um, I, I would say, uh, Yakov, two things. First, as a taxpayer... Mm -hmm. distinguishes what innate, what justifies concern about Israel is that the abuses that are being carried out against, let's say, Gaza, uh, are being subsidized by us. Um, you know, the abuses in Afghanistan, um, to the extent we weren't carrying them out, um, were not subsidized by us. Okay. So, so as a taxpayer, I think there's a moral responsibility to consider a stand on what Israel does because it is subsidized. The obvious answer to that is to stop subsidizing it um, so that it then is free of, of this uh, special condition that justifies uh, an unusual amount of criticism. The second uh, point I would make is you're absolutely right uh, the Pollard dual loyalty Zionist, where we owe loyalty to Israel thing, is the only conceivable um, uh, cause for a renewal of anti-Semitism um, by the public at large, non-Jews. Um, there's no other reason. In fact, I think all the polls show that uh, uh, the public in general um, in the United States admires Jews more than any other ethnic group uh, or religious group. Uh, why? Because um, the behavior of many Jewish communities, not all, but many, uh, is exemplary in terms of giving charity, uh, caring about people, um, and trying to hold the community to ethical standards, and so forth. You know, uh, everybody has uh, has black sheep in the herd, but I think that is um, generally accepted. So um, the connection to Israel is um, uh, is is distorted by this uh, financial relationship of funding and uh, of the Israeli and of the Zionist program, basically settlements and and so on. 
Uh, and it's also very, as you say, uh, it is a danger uh, to Jews everywhere outside Israel uh, because it points, um, it asserts with no evidence whatsoever that um, uh, that Jews are some kind of uh, tool of the state of Israel, uh, which uh, is not acceptable. So uh, I, I, I hope for a world in which, as you say, Israelis can find their own way. They can accept responsibility for their own moral or immoral behavior. People outside Israel do not have, will not have a special reason to pick on Israel. Um, and frankly, as a taxpayer, I'd rather give money to Puerto Rico. Than <laughs> Puerto Rico. Yeah. You know, so, um, but tell me that's possible. Uh, you know, it isn't going to happen. So, so um, uh, I think we're in basic agreement. Um, and I'm sad, I'm saddened by that. Uh, I really am saddened by it. Uh, I'm sorry I ever learned anything about Israel. I wish I had remained ignorant and had no opinion, which was close to where I started. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, you're right, I don't have any animosity to Israel. I hope it straightens itself out. Um, I'm not an admirer of it. You know, on the contrary, I, I have the same position. It's not merely that Israeli policy is bad for uh, Jews in America or bad for other people. It's bad for Israelis as well. It puts exactly. them in danger. Exactly. Exactly. Because the overseas connection, uh, the um, knee-jerk support for any twist and turn that the Israeli government takes um, ensures that there is no effective antidote to mistakes being made by the Israeli government. Um, you know, you have <laughs> Israel Hayom, you know, mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a foreign sponsored support for a particular Zionist perspective mm -hmm. that crowds out all other perspectives. Uh, no, I mean, Israel is actually very admirable in many ways, and mm -hmm. uh, it is appropriately disputatious, which is very much the Jewish tradition. Um, and and I, I, I think that's wonderful. Um, people do have courage and express their opinions, although less and less. You know, there's an enormous number of Israelis who have left uh, because they find the place oppressive or they don't want to be associated with what they see as sinful behavior by the government. Uh, so, you know, of all places, you go to Berlin these days and you find a huge Israeli community. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, this is, this is, this tells you something, I think. Um, so, um, uh, we have a problem, Israel has a problem. The better people are leaving. People who are left uh, don't seem to have much moral standard. Uh, pogroms, you know, I thought those were in Ukraine, but turns out they're also in the occupied territories. You know, this is not good. Uh, it is corrupt, and, uh, and 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 it is exactly what the entire uh, story of the what I regard as the Old Testament um, is about. It's about trying to find the right, trying to find justice, trying to find proper standards of behavior in a world which is uh, cynical, largely indifferent to morality and. Uh, you know, it's full of pharaohs, um, um, and 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 where the Red Sea doesn't part quite as easily as it did back then. Right. You know, that's that that's that's the biggest problem. Israel's portrayal of itself as having to do with Judaism or Jews or the Jewish people or or the Old Testament or something like that, which they got from the evangelical Christians, by the way. That's where they, they got that idea. It originated there and the Zionists copied it. Um, but whether well, it's somebody... Also, it's also, Yaakov, I think, um, Zionism is very much a variant of um, Eastern European nationalism. Yes, yes, yes. The, 
Uh, agreed, agreed. I, I wrote this in my book. I have about eight or nine places that Zionism mixed and matched different ideologies, German vitalism, uh, organic nationalism, uh, all sorts of things. I'm talking about the religious part that has to do with the evangelicals. And right. uh, whether somebody supports or uh, opposes Israel, one way or the other, neither uh, of so, no, neither such people should think that Israel represents the Jewish people or anything Jewish in the Jewish tradition. Even what they get credit for, I would not say that it has anything to do with the Jewish tradition. The Zionism uh, as, as a movement intended to escape from the traditional Jewish mindset and character and to escape from it. And I'll give them credit for that. Let them, they, I would fully say that they succeeded. If they succeeded in one thing, they did not succeed in creating a safe place for Jews. They did not succeed in creating a great society. What they did succeed in is creating an ideology and a country that has completely detached itself from the uh, traditional Jewish mindset and character. And our time, our time is... It's a sad, it's a sad, uh situation. I remember in the 1950s when I was a teenager mm -hmm. uh, uh, being very inspired by uh, the propaganda about the state of Israel. Leon Uris, right? Yeah, well that too. Yeah, no, I mean not just that. But, you know, uh, this kind of uh, communitarianism uh, mm -hmm. that was uh, part of early Zionism. Until uh, 1960. And of course, you know, and, and of course um, there were no, you know, I, I, I at that time, I swallowed the, you know, uh, uh, a land without people for people without land. By the way, the evangelicals uh, said that before the Zionists. That's a Christian. The Christians said that. I wouldn't that doubt before. it. It's extraordinarily yes. racist, which is another objection I have to. Uh, I have never in my life seen such blatant expressions of racism as I have in Israel. Uh, and I was in Mississippi in the good old days of the civil rights struggle, all the same tropes. You know, we know these people, you don't, and uh, so forth and so on. And, um, just I know. Before 1967, I heard the scene, Frank Luntz said this, I heard, um, nobody was against Israel. True. You know, people are saying that anti-Zionism, they're anti-Semites, but before 1967, Israel did not have almost had no opposition um, from anybody. Well, um, the, the Arabs, the Arabs, the Russians, and-, and Sure, and I mean, Ar but the Russians were the mainstay of early uh, support for, for Israel, mm -hmm. and then the French, um, and, uh, and then in the 1960s, the United States displaced both. Um, but, um, now, of course, people object to being thrown off their land and out of their homes. That is not unusual. Um, uh, but aside from that, I think you're right. I think people looked to this new state with hope. Uh, and of course, the Leon Uris business, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a beautifully written myth, uh, uh, which, uh, you know, as you say, it's too bad. Um, uh, Israel did not succeed in creating a safe haven for Jew. Lord Shaftesbury and Alexander Keith in the 1840s said a land without a people for a people without a land. Is that Be right? Yeah, before Israel Zangville said it and uh, no, before no, any not, Zi Jewish Zionist ever said that's it. That's just European colonialism mm -hmm. that, uh, um, being blatantly expressed. Uh, anyway, um, settler states, and we're one, of course. You know, I have yes. some... Some American Indian blood, but not enough to count. But you know, settler states are cruel to the people they settle on, and um, uh, that just is inevitable. Um, and they all are very good at rationalizing what they do. Um, manifest destiny, mm -hmm. Zionism. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, uh, I think there's no reason to be uh, taken in by any of these things. And I, I commend you for your forthright stand on the issues. Um, and uh, it's good to know that there's one other person in the world who has some views similar to mine. Oh, I could introduce you to many. <laughs> no, I know, but um, you know, it's yeah, no, it's uh, 
it's just that, you know, the press, we don't get a lot of press. And I remember many times uh, we've had rallies of upwards of 20, 30,000 people, 15, 20,000 people easily, but we don't get any press. We don't no. get any press. You won't see us, people like no. me, on the on Fox News or on CNBC. Oh, thank, God. Or, thank God. Yaakov, you don't belong on Fox News. I know, I know. I know. I know you. Even views, you know, views like mine. I don't belong there, I know. You, you won't find, you know, we are, we are subject to uh, the, the discourse. The national discourse is determined by the media which is a terrible thing. And, you know, as I said at the beginning, the only solution for an individual to retain his, his own personality because a person is only his thoughts. Everything else is possessions of his. A person is his thoughts. Yeah. And if a person doesn't retain uh, intellectual independence, he just, he's a slave. Yeah. You know, he's a slave yeah. and, and he just gives up his, his self and, he, he gives up his individuality and there's nothing left of him. The only way to succeed is to forget about conventions and forget about popular myth or political correctness and just stick to the facts as you see them and make sure before you see them, you see before you express an opinion, you see a lot of them, a lot of those facts, you know, just, just do what's right and seek the truth and the chips fall wherever they fall. What I, what I find particularly reprehensible is that more and more intelligent people whom I know are intolerant of views that contradict their own. Um, I think you have an obligation to hear, to listen, to read opinions that differ from your own. And if you disagree with the main thesis, you may yet find kernels of wisdom in the presentation. You may learn things that you didn't know, and you can exercise your own judgment. But if you rule out reading, if you don't want to hear, if you won't listen, uh, where is the wisdom to come from? You know what the Zionists do, though? They actually pretend that they portray the other side, and they, they'll tell people. I'll tell you a story. I recently had a discussion on on a video um, with a professor. She, she taught a course on Zionism and anti-Zionism in Georgetown University. Anat Wilf, she was a, a member of the Knesset. And I told her this view that Orthodox Jews have been opposed to Zionism from the get-go because we are a religion. The, the only thing that unites the Jewish people is not culture, is not, we all have different cultures. They're Ethiopian Jews, German Jews. The only common denominator is our religion, and that's all that unites us. Zionism said, no, land, language, and culture. It was taking a religion and making it into nationalism. And she says, no, that's not the Orthodox Jewish view. Orthodox Jewish rabbis, that's not what they say. I'm like, what? No, that's the Enlightenment. You know, Orthodox Jewish rabbis, they're waiting for the Messiah. That's not the Orthodox view. I said, what? Excuse me. Uh, Every Orthodox rabbi has said this. And this is what was taught in Georgetown University as sure. the anti-Zionist Orthodox view. So when you say, listen to other opinions, some student goes to a university and says, hey, well, I heard the, the other views. They taught it to us in university, but that's part of the Zionist Hasbara. That's part of the propaganda. There, is, there was, I don't know if it's still around, but there was a fantastic um, Hasbara uh, handbook that was put out for Yes, I've seen it. Yes, students. yes. Uh -huh. You know, and, and, and it's very much in that vein. Um, and, it, you know, I didn't know anything. I was blessedly ignorant, I think. Uh, I didn't know anything about Pilpo as a debating technique. Um, and, and you know anything as well? Pilpo, which I gather. Pilpo, uh -huh. Yeah, I gather it's a debating technique where basically you evade the main issue by raising peripheral details and you see, Even that is a Zion. Pilpo actually, actually is a, just means, literally, it means pepper. And it means uh -huh. to be, be, 
be smart. And it means to come up with smart arguments. Nothing in the uh, surreptitious type or, or uh, sneaky type way that you describe. The Zionists, the Zionists took Pilpul, which is a traditional Jewish, it just means debate, but clever type of debate. Right, right. And the Zionists took that and degraded it like they did to most of the Jewish religion, the parts that they don't like, and said, you know what, we're not interested, that was the whole idea, the Zionists, we're not interested in people, debates, discussions, sitting in the study hall night and day, we're interested in being soldiers and politicians and, and walking around in sandals uh, like a sabra, so they degraded people and made it into a derogatory term, but you'll only oh, hear I, that from a Zionist, you know? I'm certainly, I'm certainly observed it, um, but I, you know, perhaps I should join your congregation and see what it's really like. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Freeman. You've been, as always, a invaluable source of enormous information. Be well. Thank you, Yaakov. I wish the same for you and your community. You have a great uh, what's left of the weekend. I hope you have a, a terrific time. And I, again, my best wishes to you and uh, all the people who you value. Thank you. You too, Chaz. It's always great talking to you.